Hi there, I'm Amy from Cakes With Faces and welcome back to my planning series of tips and advice to help you plan your trip to Japan. Now I always get lots of questions from you guys about planning your trips and today's video is based on a question I had on Instagram. Me and my friends have been looking at going for two weeks and traveling around. Would you recommend booking one place as a hub to go back to throughout and leave things at or book separate accommodation for each leg? And how would you do the flights? Now there's quite a lot of things involved with that. So I thought it would make a good subject for a planning video. So today is all about how to book a trip with multiple destinations around Japan. Because even if we can't travel right now at the moment, we can still make plans for the future. All my other planning videos are all together in a playlist on my channel called planning, And there's new Japan videos every other Thursday if you want to subscribe. And my online shop is still open. I'm dispatching orders every day very carefully. So if you'd like any of my designs or if you need to get a present for anyone, take a look. It's cakeswithfaces.co.uk and there is worldwide shipping. Now on to the video. So the very first thing to booking your multi-destination trip to Japan is decide where you want to go. The most fun part. Now I'm all in favour of going to places that interest you. Don't just go on the popular Tokyo, Kyoto, Osaka route because that's what all the books tell you to do and that's where everyone goes. Go to the places you want to go. Maybe you've seen a picture of somewhere that looks really amazing or heard about somewhere online or watched a video or maybe there's somewhere you've always wanted to go. I keep an ongoing list of places I want to go on Pinterest. I've got a board called Japlanning and it's just never ending. I follow a lot of Japan accounts on Twitter, a lot of Japan vlogs and I watch a lot of videos. So whenever I see somewhere that looks interesting, I pin it on my Pinterest board. It's kind of messy because it's just for me really, but it is public if you want to have a look. I'm Cakes With Faces on Pinterest and the board's called Japlanning. So have a look at the main places you want to go and see what areas they fall into and hopefully you'll be able to group them into regions or work out some kind of a route. It might help to have a look at the Shinkansen map of all the bullet train lines. Now when I first saw this I was kind of surprised that there aren't really that many. You've got the main line going from Tokyo through Osaka and Kyoto down to Fukuoka and through Kyushu. And then you've got the one going from Tokyo up through Tohoku and up to Hokkaido. And there's a few branches off that going to Kanazawa, Niigata and Yamagata and Akita. I'm pretty interested in them going to those places because they're a bit less visited by tourists. Now the normal train network is really comprehensive and also really good and you can travel long distances on that but it's the bullet train that's going to take you a long way really quickly so much faster than driving so if you're traveling quite a long way on your route it's best if you can work it out around the bullet train network. You don't need an internal flight unless you're going a really long way, like from Tokyo up to Hokkaido, although I did do that on the bullet train myself, or from Hokkaido down to Kyushu. If you're just going a shorter, shorter-ish distance, like from Tokyo to Osaka or Tokyo up to Tohoku, you can do that quite easily on the bullet train. It's really comfortable, really fast, really good, so it makes it easy to travel to different regions. Next, work out how long to spend in each area. And it's kind of a balance between your time spent traveling and having enough time to explore each area. So you can work out how many destinations you can go to because you probably wanna see a lot of places, but you also wanna make sure you have enough time to explore them. Often organized trips seem to fit a lot into their itineraries. Some of them seem to go to a different place for every night with all these different hotels. And it sounds amazing because you see so many different places around Japan, but really how much time have you had in each one? Because if you're traveling each day, you might only have an evening or an afternoon in each place. So block out how long your trip's gonna be and work out how much time you'll actually have in each place. And remember that on your traveling days depending on what time of day you travel and how long it is you might only have the evening in the place you arrive at which if you're going to Tokyo that's okay you can go out but like when I arrived in Matsushima it was the evening it was dark it's quite a small sleepy place on the coast and everything was shut so work out how long you'll have in each place in terms of whole days for me personally, no trip to Japan would be complete without spending at least a few days in Tokyo. 
I'd always want to spend about four days there now to go back to my favourite places and do all the things I want to do. But on my first trip, I spent 10 days just in Tokyo. There's so much to do that you won't get bored. You can easily spend that long there or even two weeks probably. But then if your whole trip is 10 days or even two weeks, that doesn't leave you a lot of time for the rest of Japan. My advice is don't spread yourself too thin. It might mean you visit fewer different destinations, but you'll have time to properly enjoy them. And I think it's better to spend time being somewhere than constantly being on the train and traveling and feeling really tired and not really experiencing places properly. Next thing to do is pick a base for each region where you're gonna stay. Think about the sort of place you want to stay in. Do you want to be in a big city or a town or in the countryside? If you're outside Tokyo, you have the option of staying in a ryokan. That's a traditional Japanese hotel and lots of them have onsen, hot springs, so you can have that whole experience. I like staying somewhere well connected so it's easy to get around and it's a good idea to stay where most of the things you want to do are so you're not wasting time on the train every day. So for example, when I went to Kyushu, I stayed in Fukuoka, which is the main big city. It was really easy to get around on day trips around the island and it's on the Shinkansen line, so that made it quick to travel long distances. You could even go right down to the bottom of the island to Kagoshima in just an hour or two. That worked out really well, but if I went back, which hopefully I will, because there's lots more things I want to do on Kyushu, I'd probably stay in Kumamoto, because that's sort of more in the middle of the island, makes it easier to get over to the east side and different places. Another reason I like staying in a big city is because there's always lots of places to go out and eat, which is good for me as a vegetarian, there's more likely to be more options, and things tend to be open later. So if you're out all day on a day trip, and then you come back to the hotel, you can still Still grab something to eat or go out in the evening and everything's still going to be open. Another example is Osaka and Kyoto which are both really close together. They're only 15 minutes apart on the bullet train so you really don't need to move hotels to go to both of them. You can stay in one of them and day trip to the other. So when you're deciding which one to stay in, think about what they're like. Osaka is a busy, modern city. It's really lively with loads of nightlife and everything's open really late. And Kyoto is a bit sleepier, goes to bed early, but it's a beautiful place. If you want to get up and go for a walk somewhere really picturesque, Kyoto might be the better option for you. So these are all things to think about when you're deciding where to pick as your base for each area. Next, work out where you can go on day trips versus changing hotels. Personally, I try and avoid too many hotel changes just because it takes time. You have to pack up all your stuff, check out, drag your suitcases with you, find your new hotel and then check in. And all of that takes up time when you could be doing things. So to me, if you can go on a day trip, that's a good thing. Once you've decided where you're going to be staying, have a look at what the main day trips are. Do some research online, read blogs, watch videos, and you'll probably end up with loads more ideas for things to do. Now, it might just be a personal preference, but I try and keep my day trips within an hour or two of the place I'm staying. Sometimes when you read blogs, they recommend you go on day trips to places that are like three hours away on the train. But if you're traveling three hours each way, that's six hours out of your day just spent on the train. And it's gonna be really tiring. So I try and keep them within an hour or two, or maybe two and a half hours if it's somewhere I really want to go. You can check train times and routes on a site called Hyperdia. You can search, it's all in English, and it tells you which line to take and how long it's going to take to get there. So that's really good when you're working out where you're going to go. Next, traveling with suitcases. Now, sometimes people ask me what I do with my luggage when I'm traveling and changing hotels, and the answer is really simple. I take it with me. We have a normal full-size suitcase each on wheels and a mini suitcase as hand luggage. It would be easier taking a backpack as hand luggage, but you can fit more in if you take a mini suitcase, especially if you wanna buy a few things. It can be awkward traveling with luggage. It's not always easy, but I just try not to get in people's way and be the annoying foreigner with all the suitcases. Once when I arrived in Tokyo, I heard someone behind me say, Sugoi nimatsu, which I think means something like, wow, look at that luggage. 
So yes, it can be awkward, especially in Tokyo and on the metro, where you can end up walking quite a long way to get through stations. Some of them are really big and you can be going upstairs with your suitcases. One time we were doing a relay to get everything up the stairs, but just keep calm, give yourself plenty of time so you're not rushing in case you missed your train and you'll be okay. Just keep following the signs and you'll get there. And that's another reason why I try and avoid changing hotels too much. There are services that can transport your luggage for you if you don't want to carry it with you. If you ask at the airport or at the desk at your hotel, they'll be able to arrange it for you. I've never actually used them just because it's cheaper to carry your luggage with you. You have to pay per item. It's about a thousand or two thousand yen per bag, depending on the size of the bag and the distance. And something to be aware of is if you're traveling a relatively short distance, they can take it the same day. But if it's a longer distance, it might not arrive till the next day. So you need to carry your overnight stuff with you. Next, your last day. Now, this is just a little tip from my last trip. Sometimes the last day of your trip can be a bit sad because you know it's almost all over and you're gonna be going home. But if you go somewhere new, you haven't been before on your last day, you're so busy exploring and appreciating the new place that it kind of chases away the last day blues. So just a tip for your itinerary, go somewhere new on your last day. Next, the Japan Rail Pass. Now, I'm not gonna go into too much detail about this here, but if you're traveling around Japan, it's probably gonna be worth getting a Japan Rail Pass, a JR Pass. It covers all your trips on JR train lines, which are lines run by Japan Railways, and as many bullet train Shinkansen trips as you like, so it's really good. The general rule is it costs about the same as a return trip from Tokyo to Osaka and Kyoto. So if you're doing a return trip between them or an equivalent distance, it's probably gonna be worth it. You might be able to save a bit of money by getting a shorter JR pass than your whole trip. So if your trip is 14 or 10 days, you might be able to get away with getting the seven day pass. That's if you're not traveling on your first couple of days and your last couple of days, you can just get the seven day pass for the bit in the middle when you're gonna be traveling around and then you can save a bit of money. That's because you only need a JR pass when you're traveling around long distance. When you're staying in Tokyo or just on local trains somewhere, it's probably not gonna be worth it. And also take a look at the regional passes from my video a couple of weeks ago. And finally, your flights. When you're working out your route, you either need to arrange it so you're doing a round trip so you can get back to the airport, or another option is you don't have to fly in and out of the same place. It's called an open jaw flight. So you fly into one city and out of another. As an example, an open jaw flight would be a perfect way to use the arch pass that I mentioned in my video a couple of weeks ago. You could fly into Osaka, spend a couple of days there, then do the arch route going up through Kanazawa and Nagano and end up in Tokyo, spend a few days there and then fly home. So an open jaw flight's really good because you don't have to start and finish in the same place. It's what I did when I flew into Fukuoka, then travelled up the country on the bullet train and then flew home from Tokyo. In reality, I actually flew into Tokyo and then immediately changed to a domestic flight to Fukuoka, but it was all together in the same package. So when I booked it, I searched for a flight from London to Fukuoka and it was all included. If you wanna book that type of flight, go on the airline's website and click around till you find an option that will be called something like multi-city or open jaw. And then you can put in where you're going from and to, and then where you're going from and to on the way home. And it will show you the fares just like normal. And for more about booking flights, I've got a whole your planning video just about that. It's in the playlist on my channel. Another thing to look out for is when the airlines are offering free stopovers. Now that's definitely something ANA have offered from time to time. So you can use the stopover within Japan to add a destination to your trip. So fly into one city, stop over for a few days, and then take a domestic flight somewhere else and then fly home. And the best way to find out about things like that is to join the airline's mailing list. As I said, the bullet train's really good for long distances, so you might not need an internal flight. But if you are traveling a really long distance and you do need one, JAL and ANA both have good prices for domestic flights. They're called the ANA Experience Japan Fair and the JAL Japan Explorer Pass. 
it's a flat rate for internal flights within Japan and sometimes they have promotions where certain areas are cheaper to encourage you to visit them. And there's also budget Japanese airlines like Jetstar and Peach Aviation. You can look up the fares online. So that's it. Overall, I'd say remember the aim isn't to do absolutely everything. The aim is to have a good time. So just make sure you've got enough time to do your must do's and don't stress yourself out running around trying to keep up with your itinerary. There's so many amazing things to do in Japan. So enjoy your Japaning and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.